Good afternoon, or depending on what time zone you're joining us from, good morning or good evening. My name is Michael Eaton, and it's my privilege to serve as Executive Director of National Model UN. I will be joined later on the screen by our current Conference Secretary General, Clarissa Manning, who will be coordinating this opening ceremony. As we begin, I offer thanks to our distinguished guests who will speak shortly, gratitude to the Volunteer Secretariat who, over the course of the past year, have prepared for various formats of the simulation, in-person, hybrid, and now this all virtual National Model UN New York 2021, and deep appreciation for you, the participants from all over the world who recognize this activity as a commitment to further developing global citizenship. That you have maintained your enthusiasm even during a pandemic motivates our work. We at NMUN are all excited for this conference. And now, if everything is working as it's supposed to, the first individual to officially welcome you to the NMUN New York 2021 will be someone you will all recognize, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Our world faces the biggest test since the Second World War. In these trying times, I welcome the holding of your model UN activity. Your commitment to international cooperation is essential for tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. We can only defeat the coronavirus if we do so globally. We must come together and support the most vulnerable. The United Nations is undertaking a wide-ranging response calling for a global ceasefire and working to control the pandemic, save lives, mitigate the social economic damage, fight stigma and recover better. I draw great hope from seeing your generation mobilized to address the challenges of our time and to build a healthier, more equitable and sustainable future for all. I wish you a successful Model UN. Thank you, Secretary General Guterres. And so distinguished delegates, faculty advisors, secretariat members, and honored guests, allow me to now be the second person to welcome you to the 2021 NMUN New York Conference. I want to acknowledge that this is the first time our New York Conference will take place using a virtual format. After having been canceled last year due to the pandemic travel ban, only the second con consolation in a history that dates back to 1927 and a simulation of the League of Nations. Curious, it was a World War II travel ban that caused the only other time the simulation was not held. My own experience with the conference is long, but does not date back that far, though it was pointed out recently that I first attended this conference before the current delegates were born. At that time, the conference had a shared computer lab where you waited in line to type up the clauses you have negotiated as a group by hand on legal pads with crossouts and additions, in my case, for penmanship. I don't think any of us at that time could have anticipated simultaneous edits on Google Docs or even the possibility that we could connect remotely by video calls with peers from around the world. As I speak to you from North America, the session is being broadcast around the globe, including to amazingly dedicated students in Asia who are up in the middle of their night out of commitment to this type of experiential learning. It's, it's amazing, as are all of you from near and far. But I also want to acknowledge the inherent privilege of those of us participating. We at home or through our university have access to computers and adequate internet bandwidth that is not present everywhere particularly in some parts of the developing world. I want to acknowledge too that there are voices missing in 2021, including students who have recently contracted COVID-19 that we look forward to having back in 2022 when we plan to be back in person in New York City. But we carry on because the world needs your ideas and your future leadership. Our conference last fall in DC proved to us that a virtual simulation really can work for NMUN including the informal negotiations needed to craft resolutions addressing current issues. And as I commented to one faculty advisor, since the UN itself is also meeting virtually, I suppose this format adds current realism to the simulation. Let me conclude my welcome by wishing you well on behalf of the NMUN board, staff, and secretariat. We all look forward to the solutions you will propose in the coming days on the topics before your committees. 
And we hope that, like many who have come before you, this conference might act as a catalyst to further define and promote an interest in you in a particular topic or area where you will continue to contribute to the future, be that in public or private sector, perhaps even as a diplomat. I'll use that thought as a transition to my final task in this session. I have the pleasure of introducing someone who is not only a UN expert in her scholarship, but also a valued member of our board of directors committed to the academic quality of the simulation. Through her, we're also proud to have a connection to the Maxwell School of Diplomacy and Syracuse University, where in 1927, a model League of Nations was held that later began to rotate around a group of regional universities, transitioned to a model general assembly, and ultimately found a permanent base in New York City as National Model UN, where we now take pride in the international diversity of our participation. That seed took root and continues to grow. So to introduce our keynote speaker, if, 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 if the internet is cooperating, here's Professor Francine D'Amico. And it's possible that the internet isn't participating because I have a black screen with the camera and microphone off. So while we see if Francine is able to turn those on, I'll take this as an opportunity for a public service announcement to remind everyone to be patient with the technology this week and kind to one another, and also ask to make sure that everyone has their cameras off to facilitate the broadcast. We're, we're, we're going to go with plan B, with apologies to Francine, and I will make note of the fact that the full biography of our keynote speaker, um, who is also a professor emerita at the Maxwell School in Syracuse University, is available on our website. Amongst the amazing parts of her career, the two most salient are having served as the first American as executive director of the World Food Program and as an undersecretary general of management at the United Nations. Please visit the rest of her biography on our website and join with me in virtually welcoming our keynote speaker, Professor Catherine Martini. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Eaton, Madam Secretary General, and Professor D'Amico. Thank you for your invitation to join everybody today. Uh, it's a great honor to be with you today to follow the, the Secretary General Gutierrez and to welcome you to this Model UN and also welcome you to this discussion about multilateralism. You're here because you already have some commitment to this issue and to the importance of nations working together. And I hope that commitment takes you a long way, not just during Model UN, but in your whole careers and in your lives, whether or not your careers include working for the United Nations or, or one of its many entities or your own national government. We can't operate in this world alone, not as one country, not as one individual. We must work together. And of course, that's the essence and the basis of multilateralism and and of the rationale for the creation of the United Nations. When we try to go it alone, often we're, we, we are not successful, but when we work together, we're able to achieve a lot. And you know, that's true, whether or not we're talking about working among nations, um, working among Model UN, working in our own communities, and certainly working in our own lives, that uh, we're better off if we have a chance to collaborate, cooperate, and to work together toward common goals. So I commend you for being here. And I know how important it is at this time to be here. At this time because of what's happening in the world, but also at this time in your lives. When I was growing up in New York State, I went to a seminar, not about the UN, but about government. And as a teenager, I decided it, that it changed my life that from then on I decided I wanted to go into government because I felt it was a place where I could make a difference, where I could help improve systems in order to help 
uh, people in support of their needs and their life livelihoods and in fact their very lives. So I went from there instead of studying music in college to studying political science. I went from from there to working in politics and then in, into the private sector. Because if I was going to be in government, I wanted a strong base. I wanted to know about other things besides just, just government. And ultimately, I went into government. I had the chance to join the US government and work on programs for poor Americans, for hungry Americans, for children, for women, for uh, all people who are not have enough access to food. And from there, I was recommended to the UN to be considered to run the World Food Program. As Mr. Eaton mentioned, I was the first American to hold that position. I was 42 years old when I became executive director of WFP. Now, that might seem old right now, but I can assure you that in the context of the UN, it was quite young. I think I was the second youngest ever to, to be appointed to run a UN agency. And not only the first woman at WFP, but the third woman in the world to run a UN agency. Now, of course, Secretary General Gutierrez has a commitment to have 50% women and men at top levels of his organization. So things are fortunately much changed. But at the time it was like, who is she? And how is she gonna be able to do this? Or some guy would show up at the office and say, well, I'm here to meet the executive director of the World Food Program. I'm, yes, I'm Catherine Bertini. No, 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 I'm here to meet the executive director of the World Food Program. It's kind of like what I look like and, and what they assumed this person would be is not the same thing. Uh, but it, I got through it, they got through it, and we were able to do a lot of work at WFP in terms of real management reform. We had been a committee of another organization in the past, and we were known a lot as like truck drivers because we were moving food around from place to place. We had to change almost every system. We had really almost no computer systems. The only people who used email were secretaries. Uh, we used telex systems to communicate. We had some rudimentary uh, telephone systems. We didn't have um, up-to-date financial management systems. We had to change virtually everything within the organization while keep it, keeping it running uh, all the time. And we ultimately were able to do that. And I was really honored when I left to be awarded the World Food Prize for the reforms that we did at WFP. Look at WFP now, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate. What could be more accomplished than that, than for the world to recognize the amazing work that's done by all the staff, present and past of WFP. It was really very cool. When I first got interested in this work, I, I got interested because of actually the philosophy of what governments could and should do and what they shouldn't do. And one philosopher that really motivated me was the British philosopher originally from Ireland. His name was Edmund Burke. And you may have read about him or heard the statement that he made that I often use, all that is necessary for the forces of evil to win in the world is for enough men to do nothing. So I think that includes, of course, men and women and every single one of us to find our place where we can make a difference. And that's certainly something that's motivated me all along. At WFP, sometimes it wasn't, it wasn't easy. For instance, I was there when we had a request from North Korea, DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, to provide food assistance because of a, some bad weather that they had. But we found out when we went there that in fact, they had a much bigger problem than that. And that was when the, the starvation of the 90s was occurring. We ended up having a huge program in DPRK. But after the first visit of, of our assess, assessment officers and then a few staff members who started the work, I remember going to North Korea and seeing how much they needed and going to a press conference in Beijing after I left Pyongyang the first time. And I took a deep breath before that press conference. It's huge, maybe the biggest press conference I ever, I ever had. Huge numbers of international press all around. It was hardly everybody was, anybody was going in and out of North Korea at that time besides North Koreans. And I said that North Korea needed a lot more help. 
And some of the press were very skeptical. Well, how could you want to help that or that country that has such terrible leadership? And I said, you know, that's not our job to decide on the leadership of the country. But I'm going to quote a former American president, Ronald Reagan, who said, a hungry child knows no politics. There are a lot of hungry children in North Korea. And on my watch, I'm going to do everything I can to be sure that they are fed. And that's what we did. But do you know why I took a deep breath? Not because of all those people in the room, but because I didn't know how the rest of the world was going to react, even my own government. They might say the same thing. And they might say, what? She's nuts. What is she doing? No. They said they know what they're doing at WFP. And they gave a lot of resources, the US, Japan, eventually the Republic of Korea, South Korea, the Europeans for a while, and consistently Australia, New Zealand, uh, Switzerland, and some of the Nordic countries were always there supportive of the work we were doing in, in North Korea. And in fact, our work did end the famine in North Korea. But sometimes the work was difficult. One time uh, our board decided that although we had a, a fair amount of resources for emergencies, we didn't have enough resources for development for people living in, in peaceful areas, but who just were so poor that they needed some food assistance. And since we didn't have enough, they made priorities. They said they, the board, made up of governments, said that 50% of the resources for development should be used for least developed countries. And 90% of the resources should be used for a category established by FAO called the low income food deficit countries. Well, many of our resources went to countries that weren't in either of those categories. But what the board said was, it's up to WFP to decide how to do that. And I was glad the board did, because imagine in Model UN, if you were sitting there around the table trying to decide what countries were going to get cut, if you were from a country that's a middle income country and was receiving food aid, would you vote to cut your own country from assistance? No. Or your sister countries? No. But um, they gave us the authority. So we did it. We made a lot of changes. And I, I had the Ambassador from Lebanon come and tell me once he didn't understand why we were cutting in Lebanon. Now, mind you, this is not today's Lebanon. This is mid-90s Lebanon. Why we were cutting in Lebanon, uh, because there were still poor people. I said, yes, our basic uh, income level is a dollar a day. If people are earning less than a dollar a day, then probably the country will be eligible. Oh, he said, nobody in Lebanon earns less than a dollar a day. And I said, precisely, that's why you're not on, on the list anymore. I mean, I maybe said it nicer than that. Um, or the, uh, the minister from Tunisia who told me that he was going to tell the poor women who are now cut off from food that Mrs. Bertini cut them off from food it was her fault. And um, again, it would probably never have been done if it was up to the government. So we had to take tough decisions as, uh, as the head of the organization. And then of course we had to manage the, the organization, make a lot of changes along the way. When I look at what you're faced with today as participants in, in Model UN, I look at some of the biggest challenges that the world has today. And a few I want to point out to you, not only for this week, but for the longer term, for you to think about and I hope be involved in. There's no corner of the world that has not been touched by the pandemic. But what should be done about it? We've seen that multilateralism doesn't work very well in this case because so many countries are being so protective of their own and making sure that they've, they've protected their own country before they're in a position to reach out to others. Uh, human nature is not gonna change that at this point. But we've also seen that whatever systems that we had in place to do warnings for pandemics or to do, or to do planning for pandemics did not work. In fact, there really weren't many systems in place. So what will be done over the long term? What will you do this week or what will be done over the long term in order to make a difference for the future? It's your future. You may see something like this again, I hope not. But I hope the world is better prepared and I hope you can help prepare us in a better way. The answer is not necessarily give more money to WHO. WHO is the health agency. They've gotta be able to do the health advice but they're not the logistics agency. They're not the, the tourism agency. They're not the, the labor agency, the economic agency. They're the health agency. So we've got to have a system that is able to provide advice 
and leadership development across the whole body of any community or country and in fact the world that can react much better than the world has reacted now and now. So it's not just a fix at WFP. Don't kid yourself if you think if, if people tried to tell you that it is. Another big crisis that we're facing is, is the refugee crisis. There's still so many refugees, more they say that since World War II. And there is a great organization, UN High Commission for Refugees, that supports the needs of refugees. It's although it's 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 well funded, it's not funded enough, and it's working under crisis situations. Uh, and then there's organizations like the International Organization of Migration that are helping as well. But what's wrong with this picture if we have so many refugees? Not necessarily a problem that can be fixed by UN agencies, but it can be fixed by you governments if there are some agreements about the causes of this flight of people because they're unsafe in one country and they must go to the next, whether it's from Venezuela to Colombia or from uh, Syria to Jordan or from many countries to Europe. Why? And what are we gonna do about fixing that? And then a third issue, of course, I can't talk to you and not talk about the issue of hunger and the large numbers, growing numbers of people who are hungry. If you look at a chart of the growth in population and a chart of the growth of hungry people, you'll actually find good news because although population has gone up dramatically since the 50s, for instance, the numbers of hungry people has gone down or stayed the same. So we've done, we, the world has done a lot better in economic development. Uh, and, and as a result, the numbers of hungry people uh, have not kept up with that growth. But food prices are very high. Uh, uh, crises like refugee crises and climate crises are great. And so the numbers of hungry people have crept up in the last few years. And now with COVID, this has become a very um, big crisis. So dealing with the hunger issue is yet another. Uh, and some of it is how we as a globe handle hunger. WP only does so much, it's only organized to do so much. Uh, but each nation has to do more in order to assure that there's a safety net for its hungry people in its, in its country. All of this is to say that the humanitarian systems, humanitarian organizations, which are some of the best that the UN has, and Secretary General Gutierrez knows this, he, he ran UNHCR for, for some years, but although they're the best the UN has, they're under a lot of stress. And I hope governments will, over time, look at that stress and look at whether or not those organizations which were formed, like the Security Council in years past, based on how the world was organized politically when it was created, that I hope, I hope we're able to look at those and say, is there a better way? There was a conference of humanitarian workers not too long ago, humanitarian leaders not too long ago in Istanbul where they came up with a global compact that said, we want to have much more decision-making on the local level by people who are actually served by these humanitarian programs. But not a lot has changed. So governments really have to get into that, especially the traditional big donor governments and make some changes so that there could be a more participatory process. That leads me to my last points. I found that a career which included 10 years at the World Food Program, two and a half years at the UN, was an amazingly rewarding and challenging opportunity. I'm forever thankful that I've had that opportunity. And there are a couple of reasons for that. And I hope you find these kind of things in your careers, whether you go into business or, or government or, um, or health care, or diplomatic service, whether you work for the UN or an NGO or, uh, or don't work in the system at all. I hope that you find two things. One is that you find a lot of other like-minded people who care about the big picture and with whom you can work, being paid as a volunteer or just uh, globally on policy issues to try to make a difference for the global good 
But there are a lot of other people who care like you care. There are a lot of other people who want to make a difference. Finding each other and working together in order to achieve that will make an incredible difference in the world and a quality to your life that you might otherwise never imagine. And the second thing is that I hope that in your career, you are able to put together diverse groups of like-minded people as friends, as colleagues, or as uh, people working together in the bigger world. Diversity because we do so much better if we listen to women and men, people of all races and religions and backgrounds and make decisions with all of their input because together those decisions are much stronger and they will last much longer and ultimately be the quality decisions that we need in order to face down pandemics and prepare for the next ones, in order to stop the crises that create so many refugees and allow people to live home in peace. And in order to end hunger, it's the scourge of so many people who are desperate for their next meal. No matter where you go in your career, I wish you the very best. And the world is counting on you this week at Model UN and next month at home and next year in your jobs in your universities to find those places where you can say, I can change that. I can make it better together with all these other people who care. I hope you do that. The world is counting on you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Bertini, it has been a pleasure to have you address our conference today. And before I let you go, I wanted to draw attention to the Catherine Bertini Trust Fund for Girls that you had created with the $250,000 World Food Prize received in 2003 and the excellent work that, that, um, that, that you've been able to accomplish through that. So thank you. And now I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Deputy Secretary General, Stephanie Toski. Thank you, Madam Secretary General. I have the honor and privilege of serving as your Deputy Secretary General. Over the past year, I was tasked with overseeing the substantive preparations of the conference and together with our volunteer staff, develop a vision for each committee. But let's be honest, I could never have done it without our dedicated senior staff whom I would like to just briefly introduce to you because they deserve all the recognition and more. I think we had prepared to show them to you. Oh, there we go, perfect. So Petra Bezdyakova, Under Secretary General for Conference Management, Azra Shakur, Assistant Secretary General for Conference Management, Bandelio Delgado Salas, Assistant Secretary General for Conference Management, Leah Schmidt, USG for General Assembly, Chase Mitchell, USG for Ecosoc, Maxwell Lacey, USG for Development, Tobias Dietrich, USG for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs, and Stephanie Morales, USG for Peace and Security. Thank you to each and every one of you for all of your hard work and your unlimited support, unlimited support over the past year. I'm sure you all can't wait to get started, and frankly, I can't wait either. Over the next four days, I get to watch you develop new and innovative solutions to a variety of problems the international community is facing today. Coming myself from Luxembourg, which is arguably a small country, although please don't tell anyone I said that, I know firsthand the value of multilateral fora. They allow for every voice to be heard, no matter how big or small they might be. So my plea to you is to conduct your negotiations in that spirit, to hear and listen to every voice with intent and to give every idea its due consideration because that's how the real issues are solved. And while you all will be discussing real life issues, I hope that NMUN can also offer you a temporary reprieve from the real world, that you can immerse yourself completely and be inspired by your peers, that you can develop the same passion for multilateralism that so many of us have gained through NMUN. And that ultimately you finish this conference feeling emboldened with a renewed commitment to work together towards tomorrow. 
Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have a fantastic experience and don't hesitate to come say hi to me if you see me walking around your committees. I'll hand it back to you now, Madam Secretary General. Thank you, Stephanie. Dear delegates, faculty advisors, guests, and friends, welcome to the 2021 National Model United Nations New York Conference. I'm glad you're here. I'd like to take a moment to thank our conference secretariat, without whom I would not be here today, celebrating the start of our conference with you. They have been truly inspiring in their commitment to one another and to the quality and success of NMUN. They have spent countless hours building up to this day, and I know they're excited to see you. The most notable change this year's conference brings about is the forum in which your interactions with one another will occur. As many of you know, last year's conference in New York City was canceled for the first time since 1945. 2021 is New York's first virtual conference, and like many things we have faced over the last year, it comes not only with its challenges, but its opportunities as well. It's true that we won't be moving about a physical conference space, seeing each other's faces from across the room and hearing the buzz of excitement as important thoughts are shared amongst each other and groundbreaking work is completed. But in many ways, the virtual conference space that you're in today comes very close to that in-person interaction. The beauty of this virtual format is its touch of realism. Even the actual United Nations is holding many of its meetings virtually. But you'll note that the change in forum does not impede their ability to progress, nor will it impede yours. Over the next few days, you will engage in lively debate on critical issues facing our world today. You'll share ideas and learn from those around you. You'll practice the art of diplomacy, collaborating on working papers with your fellow delegates and promoting positive change in our world. Through every interaction, I urge you to uplift one another and support the voices of your fellow delegates. When everyone works together and gives strength to the ideas that each of you brings to the table, you'll be proud of all that you can accomplish. Being here with you today, I'm reminded of my own time as a delegate. I'll admit, I can't really recall exactly what was said at the opening ceremony, but I remember how I felt. I was excited and could feel the excitement of the other delegates around me. And I was nervous knowing at some point in the week, I would stand up in front of a large group of strangers to speak, something I wasn't exactly keen on doing. Looking around the room, I even thought perhaps I was underprepared. But I'll tell you what, the moment that conference began and I started talking with my fellow delegates, those fears went away. We were there together with common goals in mind just as you are now. Our theme for this year's conference is Together Towards Tomorrow. This theme reflects our shared desire for global and institutional renewal, and a belief that by cooperating to find forward thinking and inclusive answers to the questions we face, we can be ready for the challenges of the future. Helpfully for our conference theme, the UN has named its public advocacy campaign pushing for global access to COVID-19 vaccines only together. Secretary General Antonio Guterres said a few weeks ago that no country can overcome this crisis in isolation. Only together can we protect the world's most vulnerable, pe vulnerable people. Only together can we revive our economies. And then together, get back to the things that we love. As you collaborate with your fellow delegates, I urge you to keep this theme in your mind. Challenge yourselves and those around you to think critically and develop innovative solutions. Consider also what coming together means for us in a year when we cannot physically do that. How can we shape and move towards the future we want to build? In what ways must we cooperate to achieve the change we want to see? Can you harness the power of existing institutions or of emerging technology to transform the world around you? I'm confident that this year's conference will be a unique and enriching experience as we travel together towards tomorrow. And with that, I am del 
delighted to declare the 2021 National Model United Nations Conference 